Hello Soko family. So today's um, going to do something different. I bought the laptop again to the park. We know the last time I bought the laptop, Shamsi got dismantled. So, you know, when I bring out the laptop, it means there's going to be some serious uh, things to consider. So I've decided to do uh, today's topic. It's called Finding Isa because there's certain irregularities in the Quran and we want to kind of look through who Jesus was. So, you know, we can clearly see when we start looking through the, the information, it provides a big headache for Muslims. So now, people may remember my discussion with uh, Mansour. He had no answers for what I was saying in terms of where did the name Isa came from. What you're saying, does this name sound like that name? That's what we call homophones and you're making a, a mistake. For example, if I say knight with a K and knight with an N, they sound similar but they have different meanings. As the habitual yes. way we see the Christians, missionaries bring along evidence, yes. nothing different. Okay. So you're bringing an opinion of a scholar. No, an opinion. And a, he and hasn't brought any gonna, opinion apart gonna, from his own. Me... His arguments, they got finished. <laughs> but I thought it would be something good to go revisit. So today I'm going to provide everyone a bit of scholarship. So we see it says good critical thinking includes recognizing good arguments even when we disagree with them and poor arguments even when these support our own views. So now this is what I want people to consider. This is requires um, critical thinking to consider the points I'm about to raise. So now we have something called Occam's Razor. Occam's Razor is a principle from philosophy. It's, suppo it's supposed to expl exist two explanations for an occurrence. In this case, the one that requires the least speculation is usually the better. Another way of saying is that it is more the assumptions you have to make, the more unlikely an explanation. So this is why when we look at the name Isa and where it comes from, Muslims come up with many explanations that don't seem to fit the bill but when Christians talk about the name of Jesus where it comes from we have a very simple explanation so some of you may have seen Mansour's uh, um, presentation the other day and he says he quotes the Quran 482 where it says do they not then reflect on the Quran had it been from anyone other than Allah they would have certainly found in it many inconsistencies. So today we're going to look at these inconsistencies starting from the name Isa. So we have to ask ourselves what is in the name? So we, from the World Book Encyclopedia we see it says practically everyone since the beginning of history has had a name. Almost all names have meanings. Early people bestowed a name with a definite consciousness of its meaning but today people give little thought to uh, many names but for example English people if your name was Baker we know hundreds of years ago it meant that your family was from was a Baker or Goldsmith so names have always had significance even within we look in the context of the Bible this is the same so when we look in the Bible Genesis 3:20, it says Ab Adam named his wife Eve because she would be the mother of the living we look at Genesis 17:5 and we see Ab Abraham was changed to Abraham. We see Sarai was changed to Sarah and Jacob's name was changed to Israel. So for all Jews and Christians, they know the context of the name and what it means and why it, it held a significance to the people. So we see that when you have to understand and translate names, Backman in 1990s points out that the knowledge of cultural references and of the figurative use of language should be considered as a focal element in the translation process. So he says that readers and listeners need this type of knowledge to make sense of cultural specific names. So this is what we constantly get in the Old Testament and in, in the Bible. So now in the Bible we see the name of Jesus. It says, but after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you'll give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from sins. So the, the Bible has given us a reason for why he was named. 
But when we look in the Quran, we get to the name Isa. It says, remember when the angel said, O Mariam, verily Allah gives you glad tidings of a word be, and he was. Isa, the son of Mariam, from him his name will be the Messiah, Isa, the son of Mariam, held in honour of this world and in the hereafter. Now when we look at the name Jesus, it's a masculine name derived from the name Jesus, which is Greek, and the Greek form of the Hebrew name Yeshua, as its root lie within the name Yeshua. It is etymolog etymologically related to the biblical name Joshua. So we can see, so when we look at the etymology of where the name Jesus comes from, we see Yeshua, and then in the Greek, there's, so when he was named, when we translate it into the Greek, because the yes sounds like a, we can see here, the IE, so there was no shin in the Greek, there was no Y in the Greek, and there was no J. So this is why they've transliterated the name as close as possible to the Hebrew, which was Yeshua, so we get Yesus. But then, the, um, you know, some people will say, well, Yesus came from the Greek, uh, Greek Zeus. But this is a false, um, a false thing people normally say because we can see where it comes from, the Greek. So then people say, well, how come it's got an S on the end? But as we know with the Greek language, uh, it has certain grammatical rules. So because uh, <laughs> the name is uh, masculine and it has a subject, they added an, an S to the end. So it just goes because it's a masculine name. So that's why it comes from Jesus. And then we have the Latin, which is Jesus. And then we see with the English, the J came, and then we called it Jesus. So this is the etymolo etymology of the name, how we, we can see how we got the name. So now, in the Old Testament, we see the name came from Yehoshua. So we see that the Hebrew, which is Yod Shin, Wav Shin, Yod Hey, Wav Shin, and an Ain. So that's the long form of his name, which was Yehoshua. And then we see later on, it was, remen it was shortened to Yod Shin Wav Ain, pronounced Yesu, Yeshua. So here, the reason why it's, we see here, what I'm trying to highlight is that basically that is the short form for the divine name of God, Yeha Yahawah. So it's been incorporated into the name and then it's shortened again to the Y. So in the Bible, we see in Numbers 13, 16, where the name originates from, we see Moses named Oshea, the son of Nun, we see him called Yehoshua in the Bible. And then when we jump forward in the Bible, his name's Jeshua. So we see it's actually the same name, but just translate, like, written differently, the long form and the short form in the Bible. And then when we get to the New Testament where it's in Greek, we see after receiving the tabernacle, our ancestor, Joshua, that's how it can be translated, but in the King James, it calls him Jesus. It's because the Greek is the same. So we see the, the different translations, but it's from the same word. So we see the Greek etymology. And it's, again, we see it's Jesus, Jehovah is salvation. Joshua was the famous captain of the Israelites. So when we look at the name Isa, we have to ask, where did it come from? So we now see Isa is a unisex name originating from a variety of sources. And this is from Wikipedia. It says the name is most commonly derived from the classical Arabic Isa, an Arabic translation of Jesus. So what we have to understand, the reason why I'm making this point is because all languages have a personal name, some of which are deeply rooted in the culture of the speakers of the specific language. So what this means is that every single name, especially biblical, has a meaning. So ask a Jewish person what the name uh, you know, any Jewish name means they can tell you what it means. Like even Muslims will say Muhammad means to praise one. So everything has a cultural name. So what we see is that when you have cultural specific names, it's very important to translate that meaning into another language. Because if the person doesn't have an understanding of that language, what you'll get is an un unacceptable translation. So when we look at the name Isa, I looked at some Islamic sources and this is what they say. It says, undoubtedly the people of Musa were the children of Israel and the Torah was revealed in their language. Similarly, the children of Israel were people of the Messiah 
and the Messiah spoke their language. Neither of these two messengers addressed anyone except in the Hebrew language and neither of them spoke Latin, Syriac, Greek or Coptic. That's the Islamic perspective. And then they go on, they say, uh, this name was common amongst the Israelite tribes, such as Yeshua bin Nun and Yusha, the servant of Musa. So then they go on, one of their sheikhs, Sheikh Rashid Rida, a big sheikh, he says, the name Isa is an Arabized form of Yeshua with a transposition of letters, alterating the letter Shin to Sin. This often happens in, when, in words with, that are transmitted from Hebrew to Arabic. Then he says the letters Shin in the words al Messiah and Musa is a Shin. So what he's saying is you have Mashiach or Moshe um, and Musa. So the pronunciation slightly changes. But this is a big fat lie because when we're looking at the name Isa, this is not the same problem. So then they go on. Another scholar says Isa is the Arabized form of Yeshua, which is a Greek word meaning saviour. That's a lie as well. We know it, it meet where it comes from, but I'll go into it. And it says it is the same name, Yusha, except that the, the letter is in Hebrew. So we have to ask ourselves, if the name Isa is from the Greek, why isn't the all-knowing God taking the name from a Greek when he gave Mary and Joseph the name in Hebrew? It seems very inconsistent with an all-knowing God. And then when we go into Islamic explanations, it seems like they're confused and they don't know what they're talking about. So we go to uh, al Shawkani, another big uh, scholar, and he says, and it was said that is because he anointed himself with the oils which the prophets anointed themselves. I mean, what ridiculousness is that? What oil were there, <laughs> you know, what oil did he have access to? And then he says, and it was said that because of the bottom of his feet were flat, Mamsu. <laughs> I mean, seriously, guys, he's called the Messiah. So what are they, look, look, let's look at that comment again. And it was said, that is his, because the bottom of his fleet feet was flat. So if people are wondering, this must be why Jesus wore these kind of shoes at this time, because people must have had flat feet or something, because what kind of explanation is that? I mean, this is a big shake saying this sort of thing. And this shows you that when you look at the history of Christianity and Judaism, the, the scholars, they have no idea in Islam. I mean, I, would, I wouldn't expect that comment from a big scholar. I would expect that from someone like this. <laughs> I mean, seriously. I mean, it, I just, it's un inexplainable. So we go on. So, funny enough, the, the, the true name of, uh, Joshua, of Jesus is actually omitted from the Quran. Okay. But it's mentioned in the Quran, but not explicitly. So when we go to verse 523, it says, said two men who feared to disbelieve, to disobey upon Allah and bestow favour. So basically when we go to the Tafsir of Ibn Kafir, they name them two people as Caleb and Yusha, which is the actual Arabic name. So now we have to say, well, if there's an Arabic version of Yeshua, why is Jesus in the Quran called Isa? It doesn't make sense because we already have an Arabic name. So we see Yusha is the masculine name the Arabic form of Joshua, which is the Hebrew origin, meaning God is salvation. So now we're actually seeing there's actually something a bit similar. So we look, I looked in the Hadith and we see the name Yusha bin Nun. So obviously it comes from Yeshua bin Nun. And this is in Al Tamidi, which is a Sahih Hadith. So we see the name again in Arabic. So then I thought to myself, okay, let me go to Google, translate the name, see what it means says Yeshua, which is approximation, quite similar. So we say at least this is the more approximate name of Yeshua in, in Arabic. So where did the name Isa come from? Because we already have this name and we see it in the Hadith. So we also see um, Joshua is Yeshua bin Nun by the Arabic speaking Muslims, but the Christian speaking Muslim, um, Christian speaking Arabs, they say Yeshua in the same line as everyone else. So even though we have this Muslim 
Arabic version, which is similar, it's still a distortion, but at least it's more of an approximation. So then, we go to the Hadith, again, we look at the name Isa. So here's a Hadith, it says, Malik related to me from Yahya, Ibn Said, that Ibn, Isa Ibn Maryam encountered a pig on the road. He said to it, go in peace. Someone asked, do you say, to this, do you say this to a pig? Isa said, I fear least I accustom my tongue to evil speech. Now, have you ever heard this story before? I mean, I've read my Bible many times and I've never heard this story before. I don't think any of the church fathers heard this before. No. And this is the Sahih Hadith. Wow. What's a pig doing inside of um, Israel? <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, we see from Islamic literature, it doesn't make sense. I mean, this is like six, seven hundred, eight hundred years later. I mean, no, no one has ever heard this story before. We see the fabrication. So then we see the name Isa in Arabic. So I thought again, okay, <laughs> let me go and translate it in Google. What did Google say? Oh, I say Google. His name came up as Jesus. Okay. But this is a 15th century name. So how would I Isa, a 7th century name, translate into a 15th century name? It means that the name Isa has no meaning. And they're trying to find out where this name comes from. It's inconsistent. And there were such big problems with this name Isa. If you, we, we go to Amadida, who was the big polemicist. So what did he say? He said, the Holy Quran refers to Jesus as Isa. And this, is the, and this name is used more times than any other title because this was his Christian name. Actually, his proper name was Esau. Now, the reason why he says his name was Esau is because when we look at the Arabic writing, this is the only name in Hebrew which it correlates to because there's a, the spelling of the name Isa does not make sense to anyone. It doesn't correlate with the true Hebrew name Yeshua. So he had to say his Hebrew name given must have been Esau. But everyone, everyone who knows anything about language, whether it's a Jew or a Christian, all scholars, if you ask them, was Jesus' name Esau? They'll say no. So why is it people like Amadida thought his Hebrew name must have been Esau? It's because the name Yeshua, um, the name Esau is very problematic in Islam, in the Quran. But this is a name given by an all-knowing God. So why does this name not translate back into the Hebrew? Because what we clearly see is that Muhammad heard this name in another language, but had tr tried to bring it into the Quran, but without realizing the true root and etymology of this name. Because as we see, the name Esau is spread, spelt with an ayn, a shin and a wav. So it's pronounced Esau, written in English as Esau. But most scholars reject this idea that the Hebrew Esau is the source of the Quranic era Arabic name of Isa. Then they say, but if influence from Esau is denied, the no good linguistic explanation remains for the position of the pharyngeal at the beginning of Isa. So therefore, if this is not Jesus' name, no one knows where the name Isa comes from. So what I thought I'd do, I thought, I'd, let me look into other translations or other biblical stories to see how they use the name Jesus. So the Peshitta is the Aramaic version of the Bible and Muslims like to say Jesus spoke Aramaic let me see the Aramaic version well this is the closest that we have so I went to a person called Sebastian Brock and it says Sebastian Brock is generally acknowledged the foremost academic in the field of Syriac language today so he is a reader in Syriac studies at the University of Oxford so this is like a big scholar when it comes to any questions about the Peshitta. So I thought I would email him because what normally we see, for example, in the English, we know the name gospel came from the Greek because the Greek was the, what the Bible was originally written in. We know everything else came from that. So I thought to myself, because we see the etymology of the name Jesus, where it came from the Greek, I asked him, okay, where did the name in the Aramaic come from? Because basically what scholars will say is that the Aramaic was copied from the Greek because there's a lot of phrases that don't translate well into the Aramaic. So therefore it's copied from the Greek. So for example, 
in English, if I say killing two birds with one stone, we know what that means. But if someone from another language copied what I wrote word for word, they wouldn't understand what that was because it's a cultural specific word. So this is what we see in the Peshitta and how scholars were able to decide that the Greek came first and then the Arabic, Aramaic was copied from it. But So I wanted to find out if they had mistranslated the name of Yeshua as well. So he says, Dear Paperboy, <laughs> thanks for your message. The Syriac form of the name has nothing to do with the Greek Yesus, but will have come from early Syriac speaking Christians by the way of Jewish Aramaic, and so presumably reached the old Syriac and Peshitta gospel by oral tradition. Then he says, The name will have been very familiar long before anyone thought of translating the Greek Gospels into Syriac. Since vocalisation signs were not introduced till about the 7th or 8th century, Syriac-speaking Christians... No, there is no way of knowing. Century. Yeah, sorry, he there's, says, there's, there's no way of knowing how the consonants Yod, Shin, Wav, Ayin. So that's always the same, how his name is spelt, but the pronunciation can be different. So he says, there's no way of knowing how the consonants were pronounced by early Syriac speaking Christians, but by the time of vocalization, the Eastern and Western Syriac traditions uh, had diverged. So one had Isho and the other still kept it as Yeshua in the Western Syriac. But what you clearly see here, he's saying that the spelling was the same, but the pronunciation was different. So I just play a little. Uh, clip for people to understand where this name came from. The name of Jesus in the Aramaic language is Isho. Can you say it? Isho. It's really very simple. Four letters. The first one is Yod, which is a consonant I. There is no consonant I in English. It's a vowel. The next letter is Sheen. It's written as SH in English, but there is no letter for, for the sound of Sheen. Uh, the third letter is Wow, which is an O in English, but Wow is a consonant O. It's not a vowel. So that letter doesn't exist in English either. And Ein, absolutely there is no such letter in English. So the word of Jesus in the Aramaic is made up of four letters that don't exist in English. So if it was in the time of Isho and you happen to have encountered him, you would say, if you said to him Jesus, he wouldn't respond to you because that's not how his name sounds like. Isho doesn't sound like Jesus. So, what you have to do is, you have to learn these four letters and their phonetic values, the sound of the, how they sound like. So, you have to learn how to say Isho, and that's the, that's the correct way of saying his name, both in Aramaic and the Hebrew dialects of the ancient Aramaic as well as the modern Aramaic and the modern Hebrew. So some people say that the name of Isho doesn't appear in the scriptures, but it appears in, for example, Zechariah chapter 3, verse 3. It says Isho. It's spelled exactly the same way. Also the name of Isho appears elsewhere as Isho, not as Jesus. The name of Jesus doesn't appear anywhere in the scriptures. So I just thought I'd make this brief video so you would see how the name of Isho is spelled and how it's pronounced. It's Isho. Thank you very much for watching. So clearly from what we see, so in, as I said from the scholar, so in Eastern Aramaic it was pronounced Isho, Western Syriac it was pronounced Yeshua. But as we can clearly see the name was spelt Yodshin, uh, Wav and Ain. So it's always about the same but the pronunciation is different. So this is why like you'll get some of the comments from like Muslim, they'll say Ishoa is his real name and Muslim call him Isa. They say well it sounds similar so it's the same name. 
you know, we see some more comments. Isa is the Arabic pronunciation of Ishoa. It was mentioned 25 times in the Quran. I looked through some of these comments. Thus, Jesus would have been even called himself Isho, almost, or more specifically Isa, since the Northern Palestinian Jews pronounced the letter Shin. So sometimes you see some really good comments on uh, YouTube, and I saw this the other day, so I'll read it out. So it says, his name is Yeshua. It is exactly the same name in Hebrew and in Aramaic. In the Old Syriac, a second century translation of the Greek New Testament into Syriac, which is the Peshitta, the name is given in Matthew 121, just as we would expect it to be. But when they were, but were they just making it up? And he says no, because we see from even from confirmation of the scholar, it was through an oral tradition. And if Jesus existed and he did all these miracles, everyone's going to know who he was. So it says they were passing on a reliable memory of what the name actually was. How do we know this? He says the meaning of the name is also given and it is con con connected to the concept of salvation in the Greek text. This connection wordplay only works in Hebrew and not in Aramaic or Greek. So therefore we know that the name was given in Hebrew. And it says that is a significant point to remember. Thus we know the angel was speaking Hebrew to Joseph, not Aramaic and not Greek, because he uses a wordplay which was only available in the Hebrew language to connect the name to salvation. And as we see, it says, and you'll call him Yeshua because he will save, which comes from the word Yoshia, his people from their sins. So it says the name of the name Yeshua sounds like the word salvation in Hebrew. The angel's words make perfect sense in Hebrew, but the wordplay he employs does not work in Aramaic because Aramaic does not have a verb Lehashia to save or a noun Yesh Yahuwah, salvation. Aramaic used other words instead. It says the old Syriac translation uses the idiom to give life instead of salvation. So it says you will call his name Yeshua because he will give his people life from their sins. There is no wordplay in the Aramaic because between the name Yeshua and salvation. And this is something we see commonly in the Old Testament where there's a lot of wordplay on the names. So then when you see a Muslim say Isho equals, equal, equals Isa, there's only one reaction that you should give them, and that's that. <laughs> because clearly we see they're not the same name. Nah. So anyone who says that to a Christian or a Jew makes themselves look like this. A donkey, a certified donkey, because they are not the same names. We know through etymology, looking at the names, what it means that they're not the same name. And again, I'll just show you the spelling. Because we see Yod He Wav Shin Ain, it's the long form, Yesh Yehoshua. Then the short form is Yod Shin Wav Ain. Even the Greek, um, so the Arabic Christians, they use the same letter you can see. Yes. Yeah, so nice. But when it comes to Isa, the Ain has come to the front and it becomes very problematic because it means it's not from the same root. Mm. And this is why Amadida thought that the name Jesus would have been given in Hebrew was Esau because there is no etymology etymological reason why his name was spelt that way so now when we look at it look at it, Allah is the all-knowing God he told Mary and Joseph a name in Hebrew but yet he cannot translate it into Arabic seems very strange because the name seems to be translated phonetically that's why it sounds like the Aram Aramaic but what would we expect of someone that a uh, prophet that who was classed by Muslims as illiterate Someone would hear something phonetically and spell it. Because I was doing my research and it says um, teachers have problems with children's spelling. And it says, if you want to teach children to learn to spell, teach them spelling, not phonetics. Children will not automatically learn to spell if we focus on teaching phonetics, says Morgan Dixon. We need to explicitly teach them spelling patterns. And then they say children were spelling words exactly as they sounded with no sense of whether it should be written in that way or not. So that we have to ask ourselves, why does Allah spell like a child? Because Allah should not spell phonetically. We know, yes, it sounds like the Aramaic, but it's not spelt the same. But when we looked at the Aramaic, they pronounced it Isho and Yeshua, but yet they kept the spelling the same. So this is problematic. An all-knowing God doesn't know, doesn't know how to spell the very name he gave to Joseph and Mary. Perfect. So now it's a linguistic conundrum. We look at some people, they say, some scholars, they say, 
This pe the peculiar spelling of Isa still remains something of an enigma, but the most plausible explanation is that it comes from the Isho, the Syriac name for Jesus. And we see again the same thing, Sidney Griffith, of the many explanations for the form of Jesus, his name as it appears in the Quran, the most reasonable one is that the right, from this writer's point of view is that it reflects the Arabic speaker's spelling of what he hears yeah, in an Arabic articulation of the common East Syrian form of the name Isho. So why would Allah be taking what he hears when he's the one who gave the very name to their parents? Yeah. And as I've started this presentation, we know every name has a cultural significance. So why would Allah give a name with a cultural significance yeah. and then lose the significance but, um, when he translates the name into another you're language? You're, you're, you're okay. what, so we see it again, honorary professor of mythology at yes. Utrecht so, University. The Quran refers to Jesus as al Messiah. This Arabic expression appears to have originated from the Nestorian Syriac Isho. And we know that Muhammad's uncle was a Nestorian as well. From, it could possibly be. But we see it's very weird that the Greek Bible seems to know the name and the meaning. We see how it translates even Yeshua bin Nun as the same in Greek as the, Jesus, because we know they had the same name. But when we look at the Islamic literature, you have Yusha for the bin Nun, and then we have the name Isa. So why is it they couldn't get it right and have the same name for both? Because we know their names are both the same. So. The reason why this is important because we have three T's in linguistics translation, transliteration and transcription so basically translation is when you're, there's a similar word in the language transliteration is just where you're using the same letters to translate the name so this is why we see Yesus because they're trying to transliterate the Hebrew but Allah does not transliterate the name Isa he takes a completely different name which we don't know where it comes from but yet there's a name in Arabic for it. So this is very, very strange. And then the reason why it's an important, because some people say, oh, it's not that important, is because we know through academia, you have telltale tell signs of plagiarism. So you have something called a primary source, and it says primary sources are immediate, first-hand accounts of a topic from people who had direct connection with it. Primary sources can include texts and other things. So we see, from the Bible, the Greek is very consistent with a primary source because they understand the language and how to translate the words into Greek. But then a secondary source is one that is one step removed from a primary source. Though they often quote or otherwise use primary sources, they can cover the same topic but add a layer of interpretation. So why is the Quran lay adding a layer of interpretation to this name? It shows it's a primary, secondary source, not a primary source because anyone who knows and that's why the Bible tried to teach you the meaning of names so therefore people are well equipped to the significance behind the name that's why Abraham's name was changed Jacob's name was changed and so forth but then the Quran who was Esau nobody knows so again I thought to myself let me look at other um, people that can confirm this so we go to Josephus because he mentioned Jesus right so when Christians say uh, Jesus is confirmed by Josephus this is the actual text that they're talking about so he says it's from his uh, testimonium and it says at this time there was a wise man who was called Jesus and his conduct was good and he was known to be virtuous and many people from amongst the Jews and other nations became his disciples Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die and those who had become his disciples did not abandon his discipleship they reported that he had appeared to them in three days after his crucifixion and that he was alive. Accordingly, he was perhaps the Messiah concerning whom the prophets had recounted wonders. So then when we look at the Arabic version of this, we see the name matches up with the Hebrew, Yeshua, not Isa, because we see the spelling. And we look at the Syriac, the Syriac, again, Isho or Yeshua, confirms with the Hebrew, but it doesn't confirmed to Isa. So it doesn't matter what language you go to, what culture, everyone seemed to know this name Yeshua and they could accurately translate it. Even in the Talmud, we see they call him Yeshua, Ye or Yeshu or Isho, which would be the Aramaic. So therefore we have in the Jewish tradition, 
Syriac tradition, uh, the Greek tradition, they all conform to the same name. But we get to the Quran 600 years later and it's taken its name from somewhere else. Who knows? It could be from the Arab, Aramaic. But don't you think that's very strange that an all-knowing God cannot even accurately translate a name that he gave to Mary and Joseph? So again, we see Isho equals Yeshua, but it does not equal Isa. Because here is the spelling Yod, Shin, Wav, Ain. In the Syriac, it's the same. In the Arabic, it's the same. But when we get to Isa here, it's a totally, you can see by the spelling, it's totally different. So it's not the same name. So again, we have to ask, why is it Allah doesn't know the name of what he gave in Hebrew? Because we ask any Muslim, what does the name Isa mean? Can anyone tell us what the name Isa means? Normally they'll say Jesus. But Jesus is a 15th century name, so tell us what the name Isa means. But no one has an explanation. This is why I was trying to get Mansour in our debate to tell me what does the name Isa mean. He didn't know. He just kept trying to go on to different things because we know through tradition and first-hand sources of what this name is and the importance of it. So again, we have to ask, is Allah all-knowing? So I went to more Islamic sources to inquire about translating the Quran into other languages. How do they deal with it? So someone asked, is it permissible to translate the names and attributes of Allah into a language other than Arabic? such as saying God in English or Koda in Kurdish. So this is what the scholars replied. They say there are a number of conditions which must be met for it to be permissible to translate the meaning of the names and attributes of Allah into a language other than Arabic. So they say, well, I'll start from the bottom one. It says he should be trustworthy in his translation. Well, if Allah is the best of deceivers, that automatically rules him out. Then it says the one who is translating the word should have a deep knowledge of the Arabic language and of the language into which he is translating. So why is it Allah could not show this same deep trans, this deep understanding of knowledge of the Hebrew language when translating into the Quran? So their own Islamic sources refute them. <laughs> to translate the Quran, you have to know both deeply. But Allah couldn't even show demonstrate this when translating the name Yeshua into Arabic because we already have an Arabic name. This is problematic. So then. Again, that's why I point out what Blackman said. He says, knowledge of cultural references and of the figurative use of language should be considered as the focal element in the translation process. He holds that the readers and listeners need this type of knowledge to make sense of cultural specific names whenever such names occur. This is why in the Bible, God's always given us the meaning of names, why it was changed. But where is this in the Quran? This name Isa does not exist. So therefore we can use our intellect to understand that Allah doesn't know. He spells like a child phonetically. So we have to ask the question, who is Isa ibn Maryam? Let's ask Mansur. <laughs> Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Now, no, you're Mansur. we ask for, okay, give us a clue. So in the Quran and in the Bible, we see Jesus, his mother was Mary, Look, according to the Quran, sorry, his mother was Mary, his father was Imran, and he, his mother had a son called Aaron. But why is it? It matches up with Moses, the story of Moses. Moses had a <laughs> sister called Maryam, a father called Imran, and a brother called Aaron. But when we see in the Quran 335, we see the wife of Imran bears a girl called Mary, and then Mary bears Jesus. So how is it Allah is confusing this biblical narrative? <laughs> because everyone knows the father of Mary was uh, Joachim. It wasn't Imran. So how is Allah getting the two confused? Everyone <laughs> who you can ask for 600 years before Muhammad and before, they all knew this story. But somehow Allah <laughs> has confused the two. And if you look into the story, they actually confront him about it in like Islamic con. Uh, literature but I won't go into that today so we know the truth is out there of where this name came from I don't know where this name came from do any of you know, know who where it came from and there's only probably two people that probably could explain where this name came from and that is these two people because they deal with paranormal activity because no one on this planet knows where the name Isa came from so, 
as per the Quran's challenge to find inconsistencies, we have points to think about. Joseph and Mary were devout Jews. Would they have been aware of the cultural significance in scripture regarding the naming of people by God? Point two, what is the name meaning of the name Isa? Three, what was the Hebrew name Jibreel told Mary to name her son? Would he have given Mary a nonsensical name? So these are the questions we're asking Muslims to answer. If the Quran is the word of God, they should be able to answer all these questions. Clear and, and fourth, says, if the words contained in the Quran are from a perfect source, then wouldn't the names contained also be, origin be the original? So basically knowing the original name and translating it accurately, not coming up with a name Isa, which no one knows where it comes from. So, in terms of the Quran, we can see inconsistencies. And this leads me on to my next point about the Injil. Because we clearly see in the Quran that all messengers came to their people in their own languages. So, speaking in their own languages, apparently that's what the, the Quran says. So, Jesus would have spoken Hebrew. So, then we have to ask what is an Injil then? We see an Injil is an Arabic transcription of the word Evangelion through the Ethiopian Wangel. So it seems very strange that Jesus spoke in Hebrew, but Allah gave him a Greek titled book. Why would Allah not just translate the Hebrew into Arabic? Because they're, Sem they're Semitic languages, they're sister languages. They translate very, very easily because this is problematic because you can even look, we'll look at the etymology from the Bible. So you see, Evangelion refers to the gospel in Christianity, translated from the Greek, meaning good news. So we see in Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the beginning of the gospel, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And we see gospel again from the Strong Dictionary, a reward, a reward for good tidings is what it means. And then we see again, when the angel comes to Mary, to um, Joseph, he says, I am Gabriel, I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. Mm. Now what we notice is the Greek word again is evangelizo. The gospel is called evangelion. So it's coming from the same root. They're accurately translating it. That's why it means to bring good news or to announce glad tidings. And again, we see in Romans 10, 15, and how are you they to preach unless they are sent as it is written how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news and we see evangelizo the same root it's, it's been translated a little bit different but we know it's coming from the same hebrew word so that's why the greek um the writers in greek they had no problem translating this because they were the primary source they had understand they would, had understanding of both languages and then we see the gospel so in hebrew the word would have been beth Torah. And in Arabic, that Bushra. So when we go to now do the same analysis to the Quran, what do we see? We see in 757, it says, it is he who sends the winds as good tidings. Now what we see here is the Arabic, and that's the Arabic word Bushra. Then it says, even when similar to the story in the Bible, it says, when the angel said, O Mariam, verily Allah gives you glad tidings. And we see the word Yabasharuki, which means to give glad tidings. And we see from the, um, the Strongs, or the Arabic verse, Corpus Quran, we see the, the breakdown of the word. But then when we get to the story of Isa, it says, and in their footsteps, we sent Isa confirming the Torah that had come before him and we gave him the Injil. Yes, yes. So now we have to ask ourselves, why is it in the Bible when they translated good tidings, they both used the same root, evangeli, evangelio. But when we get to the Quran, we see the word Bushra, but then the word Injil comes out as well. Shouldn't you just be translating from the Hebrew to the, to the Ara um, Arabic? It's a simple translation because we already see the word in the Quran. But it does, it seems very, very strange. But, so we have the word good news in Arabic, but then Allah decides to take a word from the Greek cognate. 
what does the Greek have to do anything if the if the if Jesus was proclaiming the good news, which is Bushra, in Hebrew? Why is it taken from the Greek? It doesn't make sense. It seems to be so taken from someone who has taken it from other sources that derive from the Greek, which is evidence that the Gospels were written in Greek. Perfect. So again, as I spoke about the Peshitta, I thought, let me see what the Peshitta writes. So here is the, Ara um, the Aramaic trans translation of the Gospel. So that's basically Mark the Evangelist and that's just the Syriac. Or I went to their concordance and it says Syriac and it says the glosses, for example, in French is Evangel. In English, it's Gospel. In Arabic, it's Injil. And they're saying the etymology is from the Greek. So why is it the Arabic's taken from the Greek? Because we know the Peshitta was copied from the Greek. That's why they used that the Greek word from the Evangelion. So again, if we look at the etymology, it says the Arabic word Injil as found in Islamic texts and now used by Muslims, non-Arabs and Arab non-Muslims is derived from the Syriac Aramaic word Awangelion found in the Peshitta, which in turn derives from the Greek word Euangelion, of the original Greek language New Testament, where it means good news from the Greek Euangelion, Old English Godspell, Modern English Gospel or Evangel as an archaism. The word Injil occurs 12 times in the Quran. So if anyone doesn't know what archaism means, it means in language an archaism is a word a sense of a word or a style of speech or writing that belongs to a historical epoch, which is a time, long beyond living memory, but that has survived in a few practical settings. So basically what we're seeing in the Quran is that this word Injil is taken from the Greek cognate to mimic the Greek, but then it should be just translating the Hebrew into the Arabic, which is what you would expect. But why is Allah doing all this? left, right, centre. If Allah is the all-knowing, he takes it from one language to the next. And this is what they did with the Greek New Testament. Because they knew the Hebrew, they knew the Greek. But every single time, Allah is taken from something else. But it seems more consistent with a man who hears stories and then is trying to relate it into the Quran. Perfect! Because again, as I say, the three T's, translation, transliteration, transcription. The transliteration makes the language more accessible to people who are unfamiliar with that language's alphabet. Transliteration forces more on the pronunciation than the meaning. So for example, when we get like the Greek Jesus, it's a transliteration. And the transcription is where the sounds of the source are conveyed by letters in the target language. So again, the reason why I'm going into this, because we, when, we, when we do academics, we know the telltale signs of plagiarism. So the Bible shows, even with the name of the, Inge uh, of the gospel, Evangelion, it shows evidence of a primary source. Whereas the Injil in the Quran is a sort of evidence of a secondary source because it's been taken from something else, a Greek cognate. But Jesus spoke in Hebrew. So why is Allah taking from the Greek? The Greek has nothing to do with the Hebrew if Allah is the one who gave him the book. So again, when we go through Islamic literature, we see that um, Muhammad's cousin Warika apparently had a Hebrew version. So he would write from the gospel in Hebrew as much as Allah wished. So if it was in Hebrew, there wouldn't have been a word Injil in the Hebrew. So why isn't Allah taking the word Injil from the Greek when apparently there was a Hebrew? And as well, when we look at the name of Yeshua, if it was in Hebrew, why is he take, making it um, Isa? It don't make sense because apparently it was, he had a, a Hebrew Bible. So what would it have been written in? It don't make sense. So again, the quote I said a few times about being able to understand uh, languages and translate names. The Quran is not showing any of this. It shows no understanding of any language at all. So here's some of the inconsistencies that we find in the Quran for people who like Muslims to kind of explain if they especially brave enough to especially Mansur. Yeah, especially Mansur if they're brave enough to uh, address these claims. If the Injil is derived from the Greek word Evangelion, what term would Jesus have used to refer to his own message to fellow Israelites? The fact that the, the Injil is a kitab with gr a Greek title implies that Allah gave Jesus a Greek book. Point three, if Jesus' kitab was originally in Aramaic, 
then why didn't Allah refer to it using either its Aramaic or true Arabic translation of the meaning, not via the Greek cognate? And for if Jesus' kitab was originally only in Hebrew, why was it sent in a language that all of the local people did not understand? Why didn't Allah refer to it using the Hebrew or the true Hebrew translation of the meaning, again, not via the Greek cognate? Because it seems very strange that Allah is taken from the Greek, but he's given the things in Hebrew. So does this, to, to people, rational-minded people, sound like either A, a man that was illiterate, hearing stories from other people and turning it into the Quran, or a divine knowing God who knew what the titles were in Hebrew, but then somehow to get to the Arabic, he goes via the Greek. Why would an all knowing God do that? It doesn't seem like very consistent behavior. And one last thing, something I came across in the Quran. So in chapter 338, it says at that, Zachariah called upon his Lord saying, my Lord grant me from yourself a good offspring indeed you are the hero of supplication now this was a very interesting thing because obviously when you study names you then see a name and recognize or the meaning or ask what is the meaning behind it so now when we see the naming of John the Baptist it says on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child and they would have called him Zachariah after his father but his mother answered no he shall be called John and they said to her, none of your relatives is called by this name. So even with the family of John, they understand the importance of the name Zachariah, but she's given a different name. So again, this would be the straw that breaks the camel's back because we know like names are very important. And this is a very big point because we see here from the Hebrew name Zachariah, meaning Yahweh remembers from the meaning to remember in Yah referring to the Hebrew God. Now this is problematic because Muslims say Allah's name is Allah. So why is it in the Quran you have a prophet that's named after a deity called Yahweh? Because if the true name, the, the true name is either Allah or it's Yahweh, some Muslims don't even recognize the name. And I'll, let me, I've got another clip to play, play you guys. Give me a second. <laughs> I'll just play this and this I was watching an Islamic video and they talked about the name Yahweh it's just very short we'll see what they say Yahweh is one way of saying Allah by rearranging the word the, it's according to the community you lived in the language there how they addressed Allah still you have the Alif and the Lam and the Ha in it so Jehovah they call him he's Yahweh he's Allah that's see, that's word, yeah. that's Allah also yeah yeah yeah, so we don't have no objection to that. Absolutely not. Now, how do you connect it again? Ilah, Ilah, Ilahu, Elo, uh, Ilah, Elohim, which is in the Hebrew Bible and the Old uh, New Testament yeah. books before the 15th century. Ilah, Elohim, Allah, God. But the Jehovah part, how did you explain that again for people? Because uh, the letters the letter. that confirm, you know, Il is one way of saying Allah too. Il. Uh -huh. Now, when I watched that, I had no understanding of what he was talking about. Even the guy had to ask him again, how do you get Yah Yehovah or Yahweh to Allah? Because that did not make sense. I was watching that so many times and it, they're two different names. Like I was watching that and my... Jehovah means um, Yahweh in English. No, but it's a problem. No, Elohim. I know, I know, but Jehovah and Yahweh are different. Yeah, but English Elohim is, yeah. is plural more than one. Yes. So then this cannot be a lot. Well, well, the point is he was focusing on and Jehovah is Yahweh in English. So that's the English translation for Yahweh, Jehovah. So that alone, he can't say that they're both the same names because Jehovah is, it's like saying Yeshua, Jesus is the Yeshua in English. It's a different translation, yes. And that's what needs to be um, uh, mentioned as well. But certainly Allah is a different name to Yahweh or Jehovah. It's not the same. No matter how this guy tries to construct it, it's, it's actually astonishing to believe somebody would try and force a fabrication of such because um, the audience can see it doesn't make sense it, what he's saying. And, uh, Paperboy has you know, clearly constructed the arguments and showed the, um, the references too that it doesn't add up. And uh, I think anybody that watches this will see that it doesn't add up. 
and it's more proof that the God of Islam is not the God of the Bible, uh, which we all, we've been saying for uh, quite yeah. a long time. Uh, go down, continue. So clearly the guys tried to reconcile the two names, but they're not the same name. And the reason why I went to do some more research on Islamic websites, so most people were watching its explanation kind of dumbfounded. That's how my face was when I first watched <laughs> that. So I went to Islam web and someone says, what is the true name of God? Is it Allah or Yahweh? Because remember that guy said Muslims have no problem with the name. Was it, so he says, is it Allah or Yahweh. is it Yahweh? So they, their answer is, all perfect praise be to Allah, the Lord of the worlds. I testify that there is none worthy of worship except Allah and that, may, and that Muhammad S-A-W-S is his slave and messenger. And what they say is the real name of God is Allah. And this is the name that he named himself with in his revealed book on the tongue of his prophets, plural, prophets and messengers. May Allah exalt their mention. Wow, awesome. So now, if that's the true name of God, why is Zachariah in the Quran named after a deity called Yahweh? Perfect. Can any Muslim tell me? Because they just said his name that he revealed was Allah. So where did the name Yahweh come from? because it's now in the Quran and it's a Muslim problem. They have to acknowledge the name. Allah has 99 names. It was never revealed as that in, the, in any Islamic literature. So now is the true name of God Allah or is it Yahweh? Because we, have, we can't say they're the same God. Because one says, we'll look at the... So in the Quran it says, but when he came to the fire, talking about Moses, a voice was heard from the right bank of the valley from a tree in the hallowed ground. O Musa, verity, I am Allah, the Lord of the worlds. That's the name he revealed. When we go to the Bible, it says, if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises amongst you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder that he tells you come to pass. And if he says, let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or a dreamer of dreams. For the Lord, I have just put Jehovah or Yahweh, your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord. Your God with all your heart, the name is used. This is why they would know which is a true God or a false God. He had to give a name to distinguish him because before then, God, people will refer to God as Elo, Elohim or stuff, but deities, false deities as well were called Elohim. God gave a true name. We go to Exodus. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they asked me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. We're getting an understanding of the meaning. And he says, and he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, Yehovah, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all the generations. Amen. So why is it we go to the Quran and the name's not there, but we have a prophet named after this deity? Because I'm telling you, Muhammad probably didn't realize that cultural understanding of this name because that's why I started off this presentation showing you that biblically every name has a meaning through the cultures the Hebrews all knew the Israelites all knew the meaning of this name but when you go to another when someone help someone else who's not familiar with this can insert the name into the Quran without realizing what he's doing because can I can does anyone know what the name um, hallelujah means just the one praise Praise, praise, yeah. praise Thank you. Yeah. Praise Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's why we get Zachariah. Yeah. Yes. You understand? Praise to yeah. Yah. You notice all Ooh, the ah. names of the prophets are actually got Yahweh's name. Exactly. They have, if you um, translate them, I, sorry, I don't have it on my laptop now because I didn't see this presentation. But all the prophets' names over time, it says Yahweh saves or X, Y, Z. Yes. Yeah. So we, we do know that That's the prophets are named name up. was Yahushua. Yahushua. Which means Yahweh is salvation. And this is why it has an important meaning. So now, it, it, if we saw the Muslims before say, oh, this is no problem to us. But we saw a fatwa. This is from big scholars in Medina. Said that's not his name. 
his name I was am, his, his name he revealed to the prophet so it's Allah yeah. so then where did this name so Yahweh come from Ahaya Asher Ahaya Yah that's the name so now I'd like Muslims to explain where did the name Zachariah come from and why is he, he named after a deity called Yahweh if even they're making a fatwa to say that's not God's name but then God has told Moses clearly this is the name and I'll be remembered by it forever and he told you if anyone else comes in and God, generations if anyone else comes with another name it's not a true prophet so again we see the elephant in the room we see in the Bible, I am the Lord Jehovah, that is my name. The Lord Jehovah, your Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. That's in Psalms. And we see again in Matthew, in this manner, therefore pray our, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. God, they all knew the name of God. And even the Shema, which Muslims love to say your God is one. What, yeah. Let's see what it says. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord Yahweh, our God, is one. So I'll just say the Hebrew is Yah. So in Hebrew, Shema Yisrael, Yahweh, Elohenu, Lord Yahweh, is what is one God. Now, what's interesting about this, I won't go into it, is the word Elohenu, which is a First, per, first person plural plural yes. it means the gods uh, it's, it's a plural it's a plural word yeah. Elohim it is singular Elo, it is from Elohim Eloha is the first person singular Eloha but he said Eloheinu our gods why is God saying in the Shema our gods Trinity are one perfect he could have said Eloha he didn't and he said Ahad because when we got you know sorry because we know, for example, we have the word here, Ahad, but we have a word called Wahid. We have a word called Wahid as well, which is a singular one. And God does not use the word Eloha, which is a singular. He says Elo Eloheinu. So, again, how do we know this, that Allah is not the true name of God? Because <laughs> Muhammad even gets Muhammad even gets Muhammad even gets busted in the Quran. So then when we go to when we go to the Quran, you can ask me questions afterwards. So when we go to 691, when we go to 691, it says they did not hold Allah in due esteem when they said Allah has not sent down anything to a human being. Say who has sent down the book brought by Musa as a light and guidance for people, which you keep in various sheets which you disclose, disclose a lot by which you conceal so basically we'll just go to the tafsir give you a very quick explanation so it says the context notice the muslim heckler notice the muslim heckler notice i'm just talking with you i i'm not i'm not going to be rude all right pay attention pay attention pay attention if you have questions afterwards then you can ask questions afterwards so we go to the tafsir of maududi all right and it says the context in which the word allah has not sent down anything to any man occur and their refutation clearly show that these were the words of the Jews. They uttered these words when the disbelievers and the mushrikeen of Arabia asked them, tell us whether the word of Allah has really been sent down to this man, Muhammad. This question had arisen because the holy prophet claimed, I am a prophet and the book is being sent down to me. The Quraysh and the mushrikeen, the mushrik Arabs, turned to the Jews because they possessed the book and believed in the prophets and could speak with authority. Therefore, they, their answer provided the, uh, the opponents with a strong weapon against Islam and they repeated the answer as an argument to dissuade the people from it. That is why their answer has been cited here and refuted. So he says, here, it is, here is a possible doubt should also be removed. How can a Jew who believes that the Torah has been sent down by God say Allah has not sent down anything to any man? Now, they were asking the Jews, has Allah sent anything down to Muhammad? They didn't say Allah has not sent down anything to Muhammad. They said Allah has not sent down anything to any human beings. <laughs> now, 
Muslims will think, oh, the Jews are refuting themselves and making themselves look stupid by saying this. But again, anyone who has any understanding knows what they mean because this is a form of double talk. So, yes. Because Jews do not use the divine name anymore. It's been the tradition since the time of Jesus. Yes. So they can say Allah, referring to the divine God who gave a name to Moses, but also say in the same way Allah has not revealed anything to any human being because Allah is not a real God. God yes. I, I could understand this. So how did Allah not understand this? Do you understand? It's very simple. Because it's like me saying, I believe in God, and a Hindu says he believes in God, but I know that my God has not revealed anything to anyone in India. You understand? But because I'm using the word God in a generic sense, but in my mind, I know my God's name is called Yahweh. Yes. You understand? And that's what they're doing. And to confirm your point, um, Muhammad, it was actually said that no more than 10 Jews had taken Islam in Muhammad's old whole prophecyhood. Yeah. So no, ten, no more than 10 Jews were convinced in more than two decades of his uh, prophecy. That yeah. alone proves exactly. that, that no one bought, yes, until the sword came. Yeah. Yes. So obviously we see, just to explain to people, double talk is if you refer to something someone says as double talk, you mean that it can deceive people or is difficult to understand because it has two possible meanings. So when they use the word Allah has not sent down anything, they're not refuting themselves, they refuted Muhammad because they only asked him, has Allah revealed to Muhammad? They didn't refute Muhammad, they refuted the whole God as well. <laughs> but Allah didn't understand this and he gave a <laughs> reply to say, well, blah, 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 blah. But anyone else who knows languages and stuff, we know Allah that the, answer. We, <laughs> we know answer, the true name answer, of answer. God. So, you know, Muslims, they claim to be very religious and pious. stuff, pious. But we see in the Book of Acts, Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said to the people of Athens, I see every way you are very religious. For as I walked around, I even looked carefully at your objects of worship. I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. We know that God probably is Allah because no one knows who Allah is. So you are ignorant of the very thing that you worship. So we have to ask the Muslims, who are you worshipping? Because they're ignorant of the same thing. What's the name of your God? They'll say Allah. And they had a stone in Ephesus as well, a black stone. So, oh. who is Allah? What is he? God, in Christianity, God's a spirit. Can I ask any Muslim what is God? What was he made of? They don't know. Allah is not a spirit. They don't even know what his name means. So, he doesn't have a name. As, as we go to the Bible again, it says, even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond their deeds. Because you always hear Muslims say, oh, Muhammad was a good man and he did Perfect. this and that. Let's just for argument's sake, take out all the stuff we know he did like, to destroy people. But say he's a good man. That in itself does not prove that he's a prophet because we clearly see servants of the devil disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. But there's so a problem that, also because this is the only prophet where God himself yeah, never spoke to him. Yeah, he never, never spoke ever. to Muhammad. Right. We also never see that apparently, got you know, all the prophets before did miracles. Yeah. Muhammad did no miracles because so. Allah said, if you do miracles, they won't believe you. <laughs> but even when the Dijal comes, people are going to believe he's God because of the miracles he's doing. So why is it that specific time or frame, no one was going to believe, even though the people were asking for miracles? So again, we see the words of Jesus. He says, for false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even God's chosen ones. So what we're clearly seeing from the words of Jesus is that false prophets will be coming out. Even if you believe the Quran is a, a miracle, that don't mean nothing. Because God, Jesus himself said, false messiahs will per perform great signs and wonders to deceive. Who's been deceived? It's the whole Islamic Muslim community. So, then obviously, as we heard that guy before say, we believe in one God. That's all they say. Let's see what the Bible says. You believe that God is one. Good for you. Even the demons believe that God is one and tremble. So what's that going to achieve? God is one. God is one. That don't mean nothing. The Bible refutes that claim. That's what they always go to. You understand? So, after this, we see there's no turning back because we know the truth. You cannot now deny the name Yahweh. Either you worship the God Yahweh, who called himself Yahweh and revealed that name to all the prophets, or you stick with Allah. So, if anyone's sincere and they're watching this, 
we have I've clearly broken down why Allah cannot be the true God. One, his name. Two, he doesn't even know the name that he gave uh, Isa in Hebrew. Three, why is he, he doesn't even know the name of the book that he gave to, to Jesus either. It's not the Injil, why is he taking it from the Greek? So if people are sincere, we know you can either take the blue pill and wake up tomorrow, still believe in your one God and continue no, with this. Adjua. <laughs> no, no, let's do Adjua. No, yeah, let's continue adjua, with buddy. this foolishness <laughs> or you can take the red pill and open your eyes, you know, and be educated. Because the Bible says, for everyone who asks receives and the ones who seeks finds. And he says, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Amen. So this is what we're showing people. You can either look at the Quran and think it's a linguistic miracle and it's it. Allah doesn't even know anything about the names that he gave people. He's getting it all confused. He doesn't even know his own name. How can he not even put your own name that you reveal to people in your own book? That they even make a fatwa saying the Allah's name is Allah, the revealed name. So they've clearly rejected the name Yahweh, but clearly they've got a prophet in their book named after this deity. That don't make sense. So obviously according to Romans 10, 9, it says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Amen. So we are calling all people who are seekers of truth to know that the Bible is the truth and everything we've shown, that they've shown understanding of the Hebrew language when they're translating names, Allah has no understanding of anything. He spells like a child because at Isa is spelled incorrectly, it's spelled phonetically. So, you know, this is a big problem for Muslims. They can't explain. If Islam was a true religion, they should be able to explain these things very clearly. But they can't. And that's, that's the end of the that's, <laughs> that's the end of the presentation. <laughs> Paper boy from what I remember said that he will leave Christianity or will re-question his faith and I said the same to him I said if you prove that the Quran is not the word of God I will leave Islam I will reclaim I will go on holiday I'll, I'll zone out you won't hear from me anymore not my, I'll give my YouTube channel to somebody else I will zone out Hadouken!